I'm delighted to be here today, and what I wanted to talk about was the vulnerable population of patients who can't speak for themselves and therefore aren't safe in our healthcare institutions. And so I wanted to tell you just a few stories from my perspective running a big hospital. <clears throat> First story is uh, a mother and baby, Sorrel King and Josie King. And unfortunately, Josie King died at Johns Hopkins Hospital after a medical complication where Sorrel now tells the story that she was trying to say that her baby was dying and no one was listening to her. It was a couple years later that I was in the audience when, as a group of healthcare professionals, we were talking about developing rapid response teams that nurses and doctors could call for help. Sorrel stood up in the audience and said, well, why can't I as a patient or a parent call for help and, and ask for a rapid response team? And the audience was speechless because no one had ever thought about that. Many of us went home after that conference and did exactly that, allowed patients to be the ones to call for help in hospitals when they knew something wrong was happening. At Cincinnati Children's Hospital, you actually get the opportunity as a parent and a child to write in your own progress notes. Imagine that. At Morristown, two months ago, we went to testing open medical records where patients are allowed to participate and view their own medical records. We also eliminated visiting hour restrictions approximately a year ago, and since then, we've had 14,000 people be able to visit their family members 24 hours a day, 365 days a week that normally we would have prevented from coming in when we used to have restrictions to visiting hours. <clears throat> I want to tell you a story. When I was the chief medical officer at Temple University Hospital, we had a patient who went for routine pre-op labs, blood tests for a colonoscopy. She ended up getting a full workup for a liver transplant. How does that happen? She said she was following instructions from staff and thought that the hospital staff knew what they were doing. She didn't know how to say, I'm not supposed to be getting this. She went through a cardiac catheterization and a liver biopsy before people discovered that she was the wrong patient. That sounds funny, but it happens all the time. It's human nature. I don't know how many people know Guy Cuny. Guy sort of became famous. He was a uh, in uh, England, only a week, he was an African immigrant, and he started to look for a job in London. He responded to an ad in the paper for a housekeeper at BBC. And he walked up to the front counter at BBC, and he was dressed the way he is, dressed nicely, and they said, are you here for the interview? He said, yes, I am. He said, they said, please follow me. He thought it was strange when they put bright lights on him and started putting makeup on him. And before he knew it, he was live on the air because they thought he was the Apple president of the United Kingdom discussing the introduction of the new iPod. And he went, he did pretty good in the interview, but this is, <laughs> this is really what happens. So <clears throat> people just don't always understand instructions. Hello, I'd like to order french fries, a burger, and a milkshake. This is a library. I'd like to order French fries, a burger, and a milkshake. But it's really our job as healthcare professionals to get people to understand about their illnesses and to help them understand it in a way that they can. But even with our best um, attempt to be able to do that, Patients don't always understand. Now we're going to run a few tests. This is a simple lie detector. I'll ask you a few yes or no questions and you just answer truthfully. Do you understand? Yes. So what I found is that it's actually more effective to help patients know the right questions to ask rather than teaching them specific information. And if you can get people to understand how to ask questions and feel comfortable with it, they become much more comfortable and much safer in the environment. This is a book that I wrote really asking or helping patients understand what are the important questions to ask. And fortunately, patients are getting better and more comfortable about asking questions. So um, I think the keys in encouraging patients and families to be more involved in their care is really to have safer care. Teaching patients what their goals are, sharing their goals, giving them their, their test results, encouraging questions, being open and transparent about problems, encouraging families always to remain 
with their patients, um, with their loved ones, and asking the patients and families for their feedback. Now, I used to run a big hospital in New York City, and that's where I really learned about another area of vulnerability, and these are cultural barriers. Uh, and if you run a New York City hospital and you see how many different populations of patients you serve, you really learn that. Now, here in Morristown, our biggest population, cultural population, is the Latino population. And so one of the things that I always advise people is, is really understanding the culture is to go and to visit their cultures to understand it. So this is uh, myself and one of my administrators at the hospital going to the Dominican Republic with uh, people from the community to learn about how they deliver care and what their cultural issues are. This is uh, when I was in New York City. I went with 19 doctors, Asian doctors, which was our largest community that we served, to Chinese hospitals. And if you ever visit a Chinese hospital, you should be prepared, as I was not, that they want you to do karaoke with them at dinner. And so that's the president of the Chinese hospital, me trying to do Chinese karaoke. Um, when I wanted to teach uh, some of our uh, administrators and our clinical leaders about integrative medicine, I brought 300 of our top clinical and administrative leaders to Donna Karen's studio in New York City, where she put us through group yoga and meditation efforts, so people got to see that firsthand. The group of patients that are really vulnerable because they never really get a chance to speak up are those that can't get access to care and those that never get a chance to make appointments because we're so difficult to use in our healthcare system. And that's really the reason why we're seeing the large proliferation of these clinics, whether they're in drug stores or supermarkets, of urgy care centers and of quick check centers because they're making access much easier than what the, me the traditional medicine has. Um, one of the strategies that I used in New York City was to take our primary care practices and keep them open 24 hours a day, 365 days a week, so that in healthcare you always knew you could find your primary care doctor when you needed it. Here at Atlantic Health System, we're trying something different. We're actually using online appointment booking where you can get 24-hour appointments. This is our chairman of family medicine. This is, you can see, you can book an appointment 24 hours a day. And what I did disclose in my CMA, this is a company that I founded about 10 years ago to be able to do online access booking. And so patients are getting much more powerful than ever before, knowing essentially and demanding health care from us that we weren't used to in the past. No matter who you are. And so today's patients really are expecting a lot more about us and asking a lot more questions. And I think all of this is, is very good that they're not accepting of just whatever we've given them. And it's easier today for consumers to actually know what it is they're getting in terms of value of health care. And these are, these are really becoming true examples. When I went to Chinese hospitals, whenever you enter a Chinese hospital, the very first thing that you see when you walk in are boards like this that are actual prices of the day that change each day of what their services are. So that we like to think the American system is advanced, but they've been doing this overseas for years and years. And patients are uh, getting more comfortable acting like consumers. We have a semi-private labor room waiting for you. Oh, whoa, 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 I'm Don't. sorry. Semi-private? We, we, uh, we asked for a private room. Yes. Give her some money. <laughs> okay. Say, would you, um, would you mind checking again, see if any uh, private rooms may have opened up? This is a hospital. Okay. You know what? I have to say, I don't really care for your tone. And this is not the only hospital in this city, and we have no problem to... Whoa. Oh, gosh. Whoa. What? what? Oh, ow. Contraction. Ow. Oh. Ow. 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 Oof. Oof. Would you like to see a semi-private room? Yeah, it couldn't hurt to look. So while consumers are getting more active and more comfortable, it sure is taking a long time. Ten years ago, actually 15 years ago now, I started a company that actually helped consumers select 
health care quality based upon outcomes and cost. And <clears throat> it still is now just beginning to develop as a real industry to help people make these decisions, but it's certainly long time coming. And where I think that we're headed to is uh, that we are becoming more accountable for our results, and you are seeing organizations beginning to launch guarantees, whether they're outcome guarantees, or as my organization launched about a month ago, service guarantees. We guarantee that you will be seen within 30 minutes of arriving at our hospital emergency room, else we're gonna have to essentially be accountable for that with you. Now, the way that organizations essentially help vulnerable populations and make sure that those that don't have voices have the ability to speak is to really getting aligned of your leadership team around this concept. And the key to alignment is really communication. Now, I don't know if you can see this. This, again, is a Chinese hospital. When you come to a Chinese hospital and you walk in, you see these, these TV screens. Now, look how big that is. That's like three stories tall if you compare it to the building. And everybody who walks into that building sees the messages that the institution, or maybe the government, wants to give them that day so that everybody who works there understands what the message is and there's really clear communication. And organizations that are successful around organizational priorities really have their employees understand what is going on. So the example back in the late 60s with NASA when uh, they were successful in their rocket launches, uh, a group who came in to interview people stopped a housekeeper at NASA and said, what do you do here? He's holding a broom. What do you mean, what does he do here? And he says, I am helping send a man to the moon. So everybody who works in an organization who's aligned understands their priority in serving vulnerable populations. When you have employees that <clears throat> are not aligned, uh, it can look a little bit like this. This was my very first day on my job when I, when I uh, took the job as CEO of a New York City hospital. If those of you from New York will know this. This was the rat that blocked the front entrance to my hospital because the employees were not aligned with where the hospital was going. And I made the mistake of trying to move the rat away from the front door of the hospital, which I will never make that mistake again. Um, now, nowadays, talking to employees is really quite interesting because communication is bilateral. These are a dozen eggs that somebody must have dropped at my hospital in front of an elevator and left there. I get, photo, I get photos from my employees on a regular basis saying, look, this is what your hospital looks like now. And so it really is a bilateral communication. And of course, the communication is getting to be much easier with social media. Um, you know, using social media as tools to communicate not only with your employees, but with your communities and particularly vulnerable communities is very, very powerful. Yesterday at my hospital, we opened up for the first time that I'm aware of of any hospital, an app store. This is allowing right in our hospital to teach patients, doctors, and nurses how to use apps, how to begin to communicate using apps and social media together in a way to help promote health. And uh, I think that it should uh, sort of be an awakening that we are in a new world and uh, that I hope that all of you accept that in terms of a challenge to be able to go out and to impact your communities as well. So thank you very much. That's it.